We are in a study, a series, um, that I've entitled The Prophetic Purposes of Passover. And I want to begin with full disclosure this morning. Um, I have been reading and studying, and, and my thoughts and my message have been deeply touched by four men this week. And just in case you read a lot like I do in different things, you might run across something and say, and go, oh, wow, this guy said the same thing. Well, I'm going to give you four guys that I know that I've used their stuff. One guy's name is Chris Hodges. Um, has written a book called The Four Cups, and I haven't read the whole thing. I've only read part of it. It is an amazing book. Uh, James Robinson, Jack Hires, and uh, Jack Hires. Jack Hires was in East Point, Georgia. Uh, Jack Hayford. And Robert Morris, and there's one more I didn't type out. His name is Jack Deere. I really appreciate these guys teaching on uh, the blood, on slavery, salvation, those things. So I've got a lot of stuff involved in this message. So uh, this series, The Prophetic Pass Promises of and Purposes of Passover, is based upon Exodus the 6, chapter, verses 6 and 7. We began that series last week, and here's the passage of Scripture. He says, Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And last week, we talked about the fact that not only did Passover bring release from bondage for the Israelites as a nation in the Old Testament. It was a prophetic picture, a prophetic purpose of what Jesus did for us at the cross. And at the cross, he tells us we have been set free from the law of sin and death. We no longer must live in bondage to the sin that has overtaken us. Then he goes on to say what we're going to study today, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Next week will be, I will take you as my people. I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Now, I'm not going to try to preach any differently than I did first service, but I realize we've kept you for a long time already uh, with exciting things. So I want to try to ask the Lord to uh, help the words and the, the delivery so that uh, I, I won't keep you till you'll fall asleep at midnight like other folks did. So if you don't mind, let's just go ahead and have, have a word of prayer. Father, be with us so that we will not be distracted, that we will not feel bound to uh, preach everything that is in my notes, but that we would preach exactly what you want shared, exactly what you want delivered, and that our hearts would be willing to receive the message as, as well. And as I say this, Father, it's not just their hearts, but this is a message my heart needs to hear as well. Make our hearts a clean sheet of paper and your word the pen of a ready writer, and may it imprint our heart with your message today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to jump right to Psalm 103 because Psalm 103 gives to us a picture of redemption. Now, in the Old Testament, we have seen the children of Israel in bondage, in slavery for 400 years. Moses comes by the power of God and with outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment, 10 plagues were given, ending up with the death of the firstborn. When Pharaoh said what he did to Moses about they will not leave. They will die there. God took his word and made that the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. The Israelites were told, if you will kill a lamb, put the blood at the, uh, around the doorpost and the lintels of the door, everyone who is through that door covered with the blood will be saved. We're going to be taking a look at redeemed. He said, I will not just save you. He said, I'm going to redeem you. Redeem you with outstretched arm. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that was within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, who heals all your diseases, and who redeems your life from destruction. Redeems your life from destruction. 
What did God do to redeem you? What took place in your life to cause God to redeem you? What does redemption mean to you? And I'm a little embarrassed to tell this because um, I will date myself. Well, that sounds like a personal problem. Um, I, I will put a date on my sister and I as I, what comes to your mind when you think of redemption? What comes to my mind is S&H Green Stamp Redemption Center. Anybody else remember S&H Green Stamps? Yeah, I, I see that hand, yes. Um, S&H Green Stamps. My, my mom and dad would go to giant grocery store and they would come back with a whole gaggle of, of green stamps, which my sister and I would have to lick until our tongue stuck to the top of our mouths. <laughs> Terrible tasting stuff. And while we were doing that and putting them in these little books, S&H green stamp books, mom and dad, especially mom, would look through catalogs and pick out what they wanted from the green stamp redemption center. And we would take a collection of those books to the redemption center and we would trade those green stamps in on a blender that lasted about two weeks, if I remember correctly. <laughs> you know, because, and, and we just considered that, you know, in my mind as I was growing up, redemption, a redemption center, what it meant to be redeemed was to be traded for. Because I, in my mind, I'm thinking you trade the books of green stamps for something else. But biblically, that's not what a redemption is. Redemption in the, in the scriptures and essentially and basically means to buy back. There are five words in the Bible for redeem. One is a Hebrew word in, in the Old Testament. It is the word uh, galal. And it is a word which uh, basically means to buy back, but it is, a, it is a word that refers more to the person doing the redeeming than it does to the person being redeemed. Okay? In the Old Testament, when it talks about you have been redeemed, the focus is on the person, the one who is doing the redeeming for you. For instance, it is one who buys back by taking uh, as an avenger, not Iron Man or Thor or, or Hulk, but an avenger who would go in and, and make right what was done to you. It was one who would go in and be in line and they would buy back what had been taken for you, they would avenge as Moses did for the children of Israel. He avenged their slavery with acts of judgment and released them from their bondage into freedom. Another word, way that Galal is used is in the book of Ruth. It's translated kinsman redeemer. Kinsman redeemer was the one who was in line. Ruth came back with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and they had given up what land had been taken from them, Boaz was her kinsman redeemer. He was the one in line in the family who could actually buy her back, buy back her land, and he did that. He redeemed Ruth and Naomi by buying back her land, and he took it the extra mile. He also entered into covenant with Ruth and married her and returned her, this is an important fact, returned her to her original state, which was to be a wife. Kinsman, redeemer. What a picture Jesus did for us. Buys back what we lost to sin and enters into covenant with us as our bridegroom. But I want us to focus this morning on four New Testament Greek words. Four words for redeemed. And we're just going to take a look at these four words because this side of the cross will help us to do a better job of understanding not only these four words, not only will we take a good look at the one who did the redeeming, but it will do, these four words will give us a real strong picture of what has happened to us having been redeemed. First word, and I want to move quickly, the first word is agarazzo. And it literally means the marketplace for slaves. And one of the ways it's used is in Revelation, the fifth chapter, verse 9, and it says, they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seal, for you were slain and have redeemed us 
to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. In fact, he's saying, you, Jesus, have entered the marketplace for slaves on our behalf. You have redeemed us. You have redeemed us. You entered the marketplace for slaves. It's really difficult to talk about slavery in the United States today. And I'm not talking about racist issues. I'm talking about it's just difficult to talk about slavery because it was such a dark time in our history. It was an atrocity against human people unlike any other time in history other than maybe what's going on in the Middle East right now with ISIS. The fact is, slaves in those days were treated sometimes worse than animals. And it's hard for me to wrap my head around this, but as I've done a little bit of research, and look, uh, someone that was going to be auctioned off in the marketplace for slaves was put on an auction block, and on that auction block, people who were interested in buying the slaves were, were, were encouraged to come up and open their mouths and check their teeth and check their bone structure and make sure everything was okay. They were encouraged to strike the, the person to see what type of temperament they had, whether they would fight back or whether they would do different things or whether they would, would get upset by all the stuff going on. They were encouraged to give them tasks to do just so they could see how strong they were. They were mocked and made fun of just to see how they would respond to that as, as people before they bought them. It's, it's unbelievable f- for us to think that type of stuff being done. So as I read through that, I began to think, why in the world would the Holy Spirit have chosen such a word as this to describe Jesus? Because Jesus left heaven to enter into the marketplace of slavery. Not only that, he became a slave. Remember what Philippians said? He became a servant, he became a slave. He not only entered into the marketplace for a slave, he became a slave. And as we look at Jesus, especially on this weekend, he was beaten, he was scourged, he was mocked. Let me tell you something else you might not have known about slavery, but if a woman or a young girl was put on the auction block, many, many times they were forced to disrobe so that those buying would be able to see their physical attributes. And if you remember, the scripture says Jesus too was stripped naked before men. Our Savior, our Lord, was stripped down. He experienced for us as He redeemed us. He went into the marketplace for slaves in order to become a slave so that He could redeem us. The second word is ex agarazzo. Ex agarazzo is a word that carries a prefix and it means, gives the connotation of Not only did he go into the marketplace for slaves, but ex agarazzo, he came out of the marketplace for slaves. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And what he's saying is Christ has redeemed us. He not only entered into the marketplace for a slave and became a slave, but he brought us out of the marketplace for saves. He fulfilled the curse and broke the curse so that we could be set free. Jesus not only entered the slave market, he became a slave and freed us. And we need to understand something. You need to know, I need to know, we need to understand. The scripture says we were sold in Romans 6 to sin. We were sold to sin. In other words, Satan ran a slave market and he put us on the auction block in that marketplace and he sold us to sin. We were sold to sins, to demonic forces. We were sold to sin and we were sold to the highest bidder. And every one of us in this room, everyone in the sound of my voice has been in bondage at some point in time of in your life. None of us in this place are free. There's been an area of in your life, possibly there still is an area in your life that you have not released to the power of God and you still walk in bondage. It's because Satan sold you to sin. He sold you into sin. Areas that we have no control over and couldn't overcome without the power of Jesus in our life. Some of us were sold 
And lust was the highest bidder. Maybe you were a young person, a young boy, and your eyes saw things that you should not have seen. And you grew up your whole life being mastered by lust because lust was the highest bidder of your life. For some, it was the father who was too busy, too distracted by his own bondage to pay attention to you and to love on you and, and to, to spend time with you. And you were sold to the highest bidder of rejection. Some were sold to anger. Some of us have been sold to bitterness, unforgiveness, offense, remorse, inferiority. Some of us have been sold to fear. Some of us have been sold to unresolved hurts. Some have been sold to some type of addiction. And the list goes on and on and on. And we find ourselves sold in sin to the highest bidder. All of us at some point in our life has been in bondage. No one has ever escaped that. And Jesus Christ came, entered into the slave market, and brought us out of the marketplace for slaves. Now, one of the strongest examples in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, of what Jesus has done for us is found in the book of Hosea. And God told Hosea to marry a woman, a prostitute, out of the slave market. And he marries this prostitute, and her name is Gomer. Once again, this is going to date me in age, but it wasn't Gomer Pyle. <laughs> Scripture says she was a very beautiful woman. I want us to listen to Hosea 3. This is after he's already bought her. This is after he's had three children with her. She chooses to go back into adultery. And listen to Hosea 3, verses 1 through 3. This comes from the message. I love the way that Eugene Peterson did this. Then God ordered me, this is Hosea talking, then God ordered me, start all over. Love your wife again. Your wife who's in bed with her latest boyfriend. Your cheating wife. I wonder if he would have written a song like Hank Williams did. Your cheating wife. <laughs> love her the way I, God, love the Israelite people. Even as they flirt and party with every God that takes their fancy. And then Hosea responds to God, I did it. I paid good money to get her back. It cost me the price of a slave. He bought her off the auction block. He bought a woman back that he had already rescued out of prostitution and out of slavery, had married her, had three children with her, and she chose to go back into prostitution. And when she chose to go into that affair and go into prostitution, she was taken to the slave market. And she was sold to the highest bidder. And that man used her got everything from her he could, then he took her back to the slave market. And in that slave market, she was sold again to another man. And when that man had used her up, he took her back to the slave market. And she was sold into slave once again. And that happened, and that happened, and that happened. The Scripture tells us that God comes to Hosea, and He says, now buy her back again. Buy her back again. And if what I can understand from Hosea... She was an old woman. And she was on the auction block. No one was stepping up to buy her. And from the back of the crowd, a hand is raised and a voice rings out. I'll buy her. And it was Hosea. And the Lord said, I want you to do this, Hosea. I want you to do this because I want you to tell my people even though they go back to their false, false gods, even they, though they go back to an old lifestyle, I love them. Go tell them I love them. I have redeemed them. The third word translated redeemed is the word lutrosis. It means the full payment of a slave. 
Hebrews 9.12 says, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. He paid the full price for sin. He paid the full payment for slaves. He paid the full ransom. And here's the thing. When the value of something is realized by the one buying and the seller realizes it, that the buyer thinks what he has is highly valued, the price goes up. When I was a lot younger, I was in East Point, Georgia. I had a friend by the name of Tom Akins. Tom Akins took me with him. He, was, he had sold his Camaro. He was going to go buy another car, and he took me with him. And, and so we, we went to this house. The guy was selling it himself. And, and uh, as we looked at the car, I was standing there, and I was going, Tom, this is perfect. This, this, this is made for you. This is a great car, Tom. It's perfect. The guy was, who was selling the car was called back into a house. Answer the phone, pre-cell phone days. And as soon as he walked in the door, Tom Akers turned around and looked at me. He said, would you shut up? I went, what did I do? He said, every time you say it's perfect, the price goes up. I hadn't thought about that. Robert Morris brings out this idea. And he, he said, perhaps a conversation like this took place. Perhaps. God is talking to Satan. He looks over and he says, I want her. I want her. And Satan says, you want her? It's going to cost you. And God says, I don't care. I love her. I want her. It's going to cost you. In fact, it's going to cost you your son. And I am going to beat your son, and I'm going to scourge your son, and I'm going to destroy your son, and I'm going to mock him, and I am going to drain the blood out of his body until he dies. It's going to cost you. You still want her? And God said, yes, I do. Even though the price and the value drove the price up, God said, I will pay the full price to get her out of slavery. The highest price that has ever been paid for anything was paid for you. Was paid for me. I want to go ahead and jump around, jump down to the final word. The word translated redeem is Apolutrosis, like the first two, these last two have been connected. Apolutrosis, when you add the prefix apo, it means to return to original state. The full payment of a slave's freedom restoring to original state. Now let me clear this for you. Apolutrosis, you were not buying the slave, the person, to be a slave for you off the auction block, you are buying the person's freedom never to be a slave again. <laughs> Ephesians 1 7 says, In him we have redemption, the full payment of our freedom. Redemption. Not just partial payment, not just enough to become my slave or his slave. The full payment for our freedom through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of grace. So Jesus just didn't buy us back to be his slave. He bought us back to restore us to our original state. Amen. What, you may ask, is that? Galatians 4, 7. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. One more slide, I think. There we go. Therefore you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son than an heir of God through Christ. So he entered the marketplace of sin. I, I'm not sure you're getting this, loved ones. I, I'm not sure you're getting this. You're too, you're too composed to be getting this. Let's, put, let's go ahead and put the next slide up. I, I hope it's the next slide. I want us to get the revelation here, okay? The first thing he did was agarazzo. Jesus came into the marketplace for slaves, became a slave so that he could ex 
take us out of the slave market. And he lutros us, he paid the full penalty for our sin so that he could ex us, set us free, not to be his slave, but to bring the full payment, which is freedom from sin, not to be a slave anymore. He did not save us in order to make us his slave. He saved us in order to make us to our original intent, which is sons and daughters of the Most High God. Sons and daughters. I want to close this with something that Robert Morris said. I'm going to steal. Uh, I don't steal it because I'm telling you ahead of time. I'm borrowing this from Robert Morris, incredible communicator. He said, like most of us, he gets bogged down reading the scripture sometimes, especially when he gets into the begots. You ever been there? So-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so begot so-and-so. In his words, he said, he said he begot tired and he fudged. He decided he wasn't going to read those. So he just kind of fudged and he just kind of skimmed over them. And he said, the Lord very clearly said, I want you to read the genealogy of Jesus, both Matthew and Luke. I want you to read them. I want you to pay attention. And he draws attention to the fact that Matthew begins um, with... Um, Adam and works forward to Jesus. Luke begins with Jesus and works backwards to Adam. And then we find Luke 3.38. The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. We were originally created to be sons and daughters, not slaves. Our original intent when God created us was not to be anyone's slaves. It was to be his joint heirs, sons and daughters. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 in the New Living Translation says, The scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last man, Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. So here's the rest of the thing that, that I want to share with you that Robert Morris threw out this idea, and I, I just fell in love with it. He said, what would have happened if Adam had not been with Eve in the garden when she went into sin? I know she was. She was there and Adam was there. I know they were together. I know, that, I know that's what happened. They both sinned. But he said, what if? What if Adam was in another part of the garden? And God found him in the cool of the day and said, Son, I need to tell you something. Your bride sinned. And because she sinned, you know what I said. If you sin, you will surely die. Sin always results in death. She must die. And Adam would have said, But, but Father, I, I don't want her to die he would have said, there's nothing I can do about it, son. Death always is a result of sin. Now that's hypothetical. Because we know Adam was there and Adam did sin. But he throws this idea about, out about a conversation that very likely did happen. Very likely, can't prove it, but very likely did happen. Adam and Eve fall into sin. And God turns and looks at his son and he says, Son, your bride has sinned. And they must die. You heard me tell them, if you sin, you will surely die. Life is in the blood. So because of the sin, your bride has to die. And Jesus said, Dad, I, I don't want that to happen. I love her. And the father said, I understand, son. I love her too, but you heard me tell them, if you sin, you surely die. Death always follows sin. There's nothing I can do. But the son looked into the eyes of his father and he said, no, sir, you can't, but I can't. 
and I am willing to die for my bride. That, loved ones, is redemption. Yes. 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 This morning, as we come to the close of this service, on this Resurrection Sunday, this is the day that your bridegroom is celebrated as having died for his bride. But not only did he die, he was placed in a tomb. And after three days, by the glory of the Father, as the Old Testament and New Testament scriptures proclaim, he was resurrected from the dead. Hallelujah. He came back from life. Our Lord and Savior entered into the slave market for slaves became a slave on our behalf so that he could lead us out of our captivity by paying the full price for our redemption, the full price for our sin, but not full payment on the auction block in order to buy us as his slaves, but the full price of our freedom that has been called us to our original intent, which is to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. That's what we celebrate on this Sunday. And if you're here this morning as someone who has never acknowledged that, you've never understood that, you've never recognized that, it's not about being a member of this church. It's not about being a part of the Heartland family, although we would love to have you. I want to I urge you with everything that's in me to understand this invitation is from Him, and it is from Him to you, and He is telling you, I have redeemed you out of the slave market. I have given you the opportunity to come into full original intent as my son and my daughter. Let's stand together. We're going to be singing, and if the Lord encourages you to make a decision, you make it. If you just want to pray about an area of bondage that you feel like you still struggle with, there are places here that you can just come and you can pray. Amen. And people will leave you alone unless you ask for prayer. Father, we come to you in the incredible name of Jesus. Yes. We come to you in his name who has, he who knew no sin has become sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Restored to original intent. And Father, as the world shouts its accusations to us, you're full of lust. You're a prostitute. You've sold yourself out. You have been rejected. You are th whatever we hear in our ears. That's what the world cries to us. But what the Spirit of God says is for God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, would not remain a slave, but receive eternal life, would receive eternal redemption to become sons and daughters of the Most High God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.